924B, followed by 22, 3 through 5, and then followed with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 48B. I invite you to hear the words with open ears, open minds, and open hearts. I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, act with justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed, and do no wrong or violence to the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place. For if you will indeed obey this word, then through the gates of this house shall enter kings who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their servants and their people. But if you will not heed these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, well, we, we wrap up our Seeing Grade uh, series today. And it's based on a sermon series and a book by Reverend Adam Hamilton, who is the uh, pastor of Church of the Resurrection, United Methodist Church in Leewood, uh, Kansas. And I'm, I'm particularly indebted to him uh, for providing the basis of, of this sermon uh, in some pretty, uh, pretty tremendous ways. But um, as I said earlier, I do want to encourage everyone, if you're 18 and up and, and eligible to vote, to get out and, and vote on Tuesday. That's really uh, important. I invite you to take out your Traveler's Companion. There's space there where you can take notes, and you're also invited to use the devotionals uh, that are on the inside uh, during your daily practices of, of prayer and Bible study. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the gift of your freedom. You have given us a will to choose and the ability to act upon our choices. And so, Lord, we pray that you will give us your spirit so that we may discern what is right and what is good, not just for us, but for all of your children. And now we pray that you will give us your spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. You who are our strength and our friend, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, Jim Wallace is the, um, is the founder of Sojourners Magazine and is also one of the spiritual advisors to President Obama. And he tells a story about two senators. Uh, one senator was a Republican and the other senator was a Democrat. And one day they started talking about religion. And the Republican senator looks at the Democrat senator and he says, you know, the problem with you Democrats is you don't know anything about religion. Well, that offended the Democrat senator. And he said, well, we do know stuff about religion. I know that really well. The Republican senator said, I bet you $20 that you can't recite the Lord's Prayer right now. The Democrat says, sure I can, and I'm going to take your $20. says, now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And the Republican senator reached in his pocket and pulled out a 20 and said, here you go. <laughs> I thought there was no way you would ever get that. You know, a lot of politicians, both Republicans and Democrats, give a lot of lip service to paying homage to God and, and principles that are found in the Bible, but sometimes I wonder if they've actually read the Bible. You know, the Bible says a lot about what God expects of leaders and of nations. It has a whole lot to say about that, especially in the Old Testament. And Jesus follows up on that in the New Testament and pretty much confirms what the Old Testament says when it comes to this. So the question today is, what does God expect? of our leaders and of us as a nation. Now, if we're gonna answer that question, we need to understand three Hebrew words uh, that are often mentioned when, when discussing that question in the Old Testament. Um, would y'all mind learning a little bit of Hebrew this morning? 
I promise we'll start easy and work our way up. Is that okay? All right, the first word is mishpat. Can y'all say mishpat? Mishpat. 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 Not mushpat, but if you, if you don't seek mishpat, you might get thrown in the mushpat. Amen? Um, mishpat uh, appears 421 times in the Old Testament. And if you don't know stuff like this, that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, the Bible says a lot about this word. It's usually translated as justice. So mishpat means justice. Now, when I think about justice, I kind of think about setting the balances right, right? You know, correcting an injustice. And mishpat certainly has something to do with that. But more generally, mishpat really means making sure that everyone gets what is fair, making sure that everyone gets what is good, and making sure that everyone gets what is right. So who does that apply to? Well, the writers of the Bible and God in the, in the Bible consistently is concerned with the people on the lower rungs of society. And sure enough, every time the word mishpat appears in the Old Testament, 421 times, it refers to providing justice for the people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. The rich and the powerful already had everything that they needed. Why did they need justice? It was the poor and the disenfranchised who needed mishpat. Justice was for the workers and for children and for orphans and for widows, for the poor, for the foreigners, and for the powerless in society. And time and time again, God tells the rulers to make sure that everyone gets what is fair and right and good. Through the prophets, God then warns them that if they don't bring justice to the powerless, if the kings don't bring justice to the powerless, then God will do that himself. And it ain't pretty when that happens. Amen? Listen to these words from Psalm 146, 7 through 9. These are representative of many other passages in the Old Testament. The psalmist says, God gives justice to people who are oppressed. That's mishpat, to people who are oppressed. Gives bread to people who are starving. The Lord frees prisoners, makes the blind see, straightens up those who are bent low. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects immigrants, helps orphans and widows, but makes the way of the wicked twist and turn. So mishpat is our first, first Hebrew word. The second one is tzedakah, tzedakah. Can y'all say that together? Tzedakah. The first letter there uh, has a sound uh, to it. It's uh, the word in Zion. Most, most of the time it's translated as a Z uh, when you transliterate it into English. But tzedakah often appears with mishpat. And it's usually translated as righteousness. Let's say that together. Tzedakah is righteousness. Now, righteousness is doing the right thing at the right time, in the right place, for the right reasons. Do you hear that? Can you say that with me? Tzedakah is doing the right thing at the right time, in the right place, for the right reasons. It's doing right when nobody is watching. Y'all run a stop sign at 2 o'clock in the morning, no police officers are around? I know Keith Bird doesn't ever do that. But, uh, nobody wants to confess that in front of a police officer. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. But um, that's what Sedekah is. It's doing the right thing when nobody's watching. And God, of course, is the standard of righteousness. And so we should always ask ourselves as individuals if what we're doing or what we're seeking will please God or not. And, but that's not just an individual thing. The Bible says repeatedly that leaders and nations should ask themselves the same question. Is what we are doing and is what we are about to do pleasing to God? Now, if the rulers did that, they would be blessed. But if they didn't, judgment would come. Now, the last word... The last Hebrew word that we're going to learn this morning is, and this one's a little hard, it looks simpler, doesn't it? But it's, uh, it's chesed. Did you hear that? It's chesed. 
Yeah, if you've got, if you've got a cold and you need to get some of that phlegm out this morning, you might just want to say chesed over and over and over again. Um, chesed is the word used in that psalm, which repeats over and over again, God's steadfast love endures forever. Chesed means steadfast love or loving kindness or mercy. Now, chesed is not about feeling love inside. It's a, there is a word for that in Hebrew. Chesed is about doing love. It's about love in action. Chesed is treating someone with kindness and respect and love even when they don't deserve it. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, love your enemies. Chesed your enemies. Show kindness, show mercy, show love even to your enemy. And just as righteousness or uh, tzedakah goes along with mishpat, so does chesed. You may remember Micah 6, 8. We're going to sing it in, in our closing hymn today. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to do mishpat, mishpat, to love mercy, to love chesed, and walk humbly with your God? Now, these three words... Mishpat, Tzedakah, and Hesed describe God, right? God brings justice. God brings Mishpat. God is righteous. God is Tzedakah. God's steadfast love, God's Hesed, endures forever and ever. Now, God is those things. But here's the catch. God expects those things of you and of me, of our leaders and of our nation. Listen to Jeremiah 9.24 once again. Jeremiah the prophet writes on God's behalf, I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love, chesed. I act with justice, mishpat. And I act with righteousness, tzedakah, in the earth. For in these things, I delight. But listen to the word of warning from Jeremiah 22, 3 through 5. God says, do what is just and right. Do what is mishpat and tzedakah. Rescue the oppressed from the power of the oppressor. Don't exploit or mistreat the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. Don't spill the blood of the innocent. And God says in verse 4 that if the kings will do this, they will be blessed. But then listen to what he says in verse 5. God says, I swear by myself, if you ignore these things, that this palace, this house, will become a ruin. Now, what's important to note here is that Republicans and Democrats share these concerns for justice and righteousness and loving kindness and mercy. Now, we're a mixed group here. We have some Democrats here. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. And we have some Republicans. I know that because I've read your Facebook posts. Amen? <laughs> and, but let me ask you, ask everyone this question. How many of you think that children should go to school hungry? Raise your hand. <laughs> no, you don't. You just don't know yet. Um, um, what about... How many of you think that a sick child should not be able to see a doctor? Raise your hand. How many of you think employers should take advantage of and abuse their workers? Raise your hand. How many of you think that people should starve to death? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. Nobody. We share the same concerns as Republicans and Democrats. We simply understand their causes and their solutions differently. Amen? Everybody wants everyone to be treated fairly. All of us want people to do the right thing, and all of us want to be a people of love and mercy. You know, that was the dream of America, the Patriots' dream that we sang about earlier. If you got a dollar, get, take it out. If you didn't put it in the offering plate, I brought one. If you didn't bring a dollar, we'll go, you can look at it there on the screen. Um, flip it over on the back. 
You see on the, on the left side there, there's a pyramid. You see that? Y'all have seen that before. Um, now, I want you to forget everything that you saw on National Treasure. <laughs> Amen. Um, we're going to go to the source for this. And, and Charles Thompson was the person who completed the design uh, for, for this particular graphic. And this is what he said about this graphic. You see the pyramid there? The pyramid represents America. And if you look very closely, there are 13 steps. But the pyramid is incomplete. And what Thompson said, of course, the 13 steps represent the 13 original colonies. And Thompson said that America is never complete, that every generation has to do its part to fulfill what is the dream of America. Every generation has to do its part. Now, look below the pyramid. Uh, it says Novus Ordo Seclorum. Y'all see, can you see that? Novus Ordo Seclorum. And those words mean the new order of the ages, new order of the ages. Now, what that meant is that the founding fathers believed that America was, the government of America was doing something so new, so bold, so right, so good, and so just that America would be that shining city on a hill that everyone, all the nations would admire and all of the nations would want to be like, okay? And so they believed that that would bring a new order. Uh, Thomas Paine put it this way in 1776. He said, the cause of America is in a great measure the cause of all mankind. Now that was the American dream in its most original concept. It was not about getting all that we can for ourselves, but doing what we can do as a nation to make the world a better place. Amen? Amen. Now above the pyramid, you see, it says, Anuit Keptis or Anuit uh, Coeptus. And that means favors our understanding. It doesn't have a subject, just a fragment of a sentence. Anuit Keptis means favors our understanding. So, but who favors our understanding? Well, it's that weird triangle-shaped eye that represents the divine eye of providence. It represents God. Now, what, what Thompson was saying was that against all odds in the Revolutionary War, God had favored America. And that was because we stood for justice and because we stood for doing the right thing and we stood for kindness and mercy. And as long as we continue to pursue those goals, as long as America keeps doing that, God will continue to shed his grace on thee. Now, look over to the other side on the right side. You see the eagle there? And um, th there's a bald eagle. And you might, if you look really closely, you might see that he's holding a banner in his beak. And on that banner, read the words, E Pluribus Unum. Have you heard that before? E pluribus unum. And E pluribus unum means out of many, one. That was the original motto of our nation until we changed it in 1956 to, what's our motto now? Do anybody know? In God we trust. Zoe Rysdale got it. That's awesome. In God we trust. But um, so E pluribus unum referred to us as a nation of immigrants. You know, if, even if you're a Native American, you are an immigrant to this country. You just happen to immigrate after the last ice age before any of the rest of us could get here. Amen? Okay? We're a nation of immigrants. And in Deuteronomy 10, 19, God gives the Hebrews a commandment because they were immigrants too. God says, you must also love immigrants because you were immigrants in Egypt. Now, the immigration issue today is not simple. And I'm not going to give you some kind of one sentence answer. Uh, and I don't trust any politician who tries to do that either. Amen? It's complicated. But I do know that whatever the solution is, that it involves treating today's immigrants with justice and with righteousness, with loving kindness, and with mercy. Now, if you look again at the eagle in, excuse me, in, in one of the talents, he's holding 13, again, for the original 13 colonies, 13 arrows. 
13 arrows, and those represented the 13 militias in the 13 original colonies, and therefore represent America's military might. But look over in the other talon. Anybody know what that is? It's an olive branch, which is a symbol of peace. Now, Thompson in, did something intentionally. Which way does the, is the eagle facing? Toward the olive branch or toward the arrows? Toward the olive branch. And what Thompson was saying is that while we may use our military might, while war may be okay occasionally as a very last resort, our focus as a nation is on peace, bringing peace to the world. War only as is necessary to bring about that end. War is always an evil, although sometimes it is a necessary evil. Now, the question for us today as Americans is how do we balance our military strength with our pursuit of peace in the world. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke especially, Jesus tells us, blessed are the poor. All of those things are about mishpat, or justice. Jesus also says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's tzedakah. And then finally, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. And that word is chesed. Blessed are those who practice chesed. Jesus also says, blessed are the peacemakers. So, what would Jesus say if he came to us today? What kinds of questions would he ask of us? Would he talk at all about abortion? If so, what would he say? Would he talk about homosexuality or not? And if so, what would he say or not say? What would Jesus have to say about war, or immigration, or health care, or the environment? What would he say about our materialism that goes right hand in hand with the poverty around us? What would Jesus say about the 14,000 homeless children in Arkansas? What would Jesus say about the fact that a child dies every 30 seconds from a tre treatable disease like malaria that would cost $10 to prevent? What would Jesus say that we're doing right? And what would Jesus say that we're doing wrong? You know, a disciple Bible study is always fun. But it's especially fun in an election year. Amen? And, uh, of course, our disciple Bible study has been, has been great this year. I remember the group that we had in, in 2004. Uh, this is not them because I don't want to rat them out. There are some of these people in church today. But in that group, there were three Democrats three Republicans, and me firmly in the neutral zone. Amen? And, you know, what happens in disciple stays in disciple. But I, I will say that there were times in those first two or three months that I wasn't sure we were going to make it through the election. But we did. And at the end of it all, at the end of that 34 weeks, we loved each other as much as any disciple group loves each other. And we still do. I don't think anybody switched political party. But we came to understand that while we may come up with different solutions, we could all agree on the problems. People in our world are being treated unfairly. People are doing wrong. And people are not loving one another as Christ first loved us. And in the end, Mishpat, Sedekah, and Chesed all begin with you and with me. Will we treat one another fairly? Will we do the right thing even when nobody is looking? And will we show love and kindness and mercy to those who do not deserve it? I hope that we will do that as a church family. And I hope you will join with me in praying that we will do that as a nation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. And this morning, I, I'm going to invite you to pray on your own as, as I guide you. Uh, so let us, 
Let us lay our hearts open before God. Let us pray for those who suffer from injustice. Let us pray for those who are not doing the right thing at the right time in the right place for the right reasons. Let us pray for those who do not show mercy. And let us pray for those who are offering themselves to serve in public office. Let us pray for those who are voting. Let us pray for those who are seeking the presidency, which we know is a task too big for any one person. Let us pray for the one who will be our next president, that he will seek justice and righteousness and show mercy. And let us pray for our country, that we may be what justice and righteousness and mercy look like to the rest of the world. And finally, let us pray for ourselves, that we will be humble in the midst of disagreement, and that we will see those who disagree with us not as our enemies, but as God's children too. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and King. Amen.